see sediment loss. Uh, farmers hate it. Uh, it. It's easy to see the problems it causes. Uh, and when you see the water coming off the field, it's a pretty visual thing. And when you see it in the rivers, uh, pretty visual. So we want to stop uh, anything we can do to stop sediment loss. It keeps the nutrients, it keeps the, the, the soil in our fields. Uh, that's a good thing. Once in the, in the water, uh, it can cause pretty bad problems, particularly in loss of uh, of volume, and so we've got this uh, loss of storage capacity in reservoirs. Um, that's one of the issues in Kansas, at least. Uh, particularly, we use a lot of our reservoirs to store water, uh, and then that water uh, maintains stream flows and is used for drinking water and other things down the down the road. And uh, our our reservoirs start filling up with sediment, then we don't have the same storage capacity, and so that's a pretty big issue for us. Um, uh, it also causes uh, murkiness and can cause, can uh, shade out aquatic species that try and grow and things. So anyway, it, it causes problems. We actually um, spend, I think, about $20 million uh, dredging one of our reservoirs uh, about two years ago. So it's pretty, it can be a pretty direct cost to the state and to the taxpayers and to the citizens if we don't stop sediment loss. Now, nutrient loss, it's not quite as easy to see, right? We can have really, really clean water coming out of fields, coming out of tile drains, uh, <clears throat> and it can still carry a fair amount of nutrients. And those nutrients um, don't look, uh, automatically don't look like they're causing much of a problem. But once they get in the water, and I don't know if you can see this, this is a pretty green uh, lake. Uh, this is a blue-green algal bloom, actually a toxic algae bloom. Uh, in one of our reservoirs. Uh, Milford Reservoir uh, is our largest reservoir in the state. It's the reservoir with most recreation uh, opportunity and there they've had a lot of blue-green al al algal blooms. Uh, this is a, a newspaper, I guess a news article from this last summer. 13 lakes under blue-green algae warnings. So we've had a, a fair amount of problems. When those nutrients get into reservoirs, they do the same thing in the reservoirs they do in, in our fields. They promote growth, right? It shouldn't be any surprise to us that if we put nutrients in the water, we get, we get more algae. Um, occasionally, we get uh, some things. This is a, a magazine cover from a few years back when there was a, a big algal bloom in Lake Erie that shut down the water supply for the city, city of Toledo for about three days. And occasionally, you get some really big things in the nation, and those big events, even though that's not happening here in Oklahoma or in Kansas, it sends a ripple through kind of the, the um, I guess, the political spectrum, and people start getting pretty worried about, about uh, that happening in their backyard. So um, in Kansas, they, they're keeping, we kind of try and keep some tabs on what's going on in the state. Uh, since 2010, so in, in uh, eight years, from 2010 to 2017, we had toxic blue-green algal blooms uh, pretty much all across the state, right? Uh, 68 lakes, 39 different counties, border to border. Um, last, and, and then we start seeing uh, newspaper headings like this, going to a lake in Kansas, make sure the water's safe. That's not a, that's not a really promising thing for people uh, in the state. And, when you start seeing this happen too much, then they start looking at where it's coming from, they start looking at agriculture, and they want, they want to see that we're taking good care of our nutrients. Most of these nutrients are, we're the number one user of nutrients, we're the number one user of phosphorus, and so it's not, uh, it's not a surprise that they'd look towards us. Now, how about Oklahoma? Um, actually, uh, Oklahoma, probably one of the landmark uh, cases uh, re dealing with water quality and nutrients happened here in Oklahoma, water quality and phosphorus. The first uh, lawsuit that I'm aware of dealing with phosphorus and water quality was here in Oklahoma where this, the, uh, and this hit, uh, this is the Washington Post, it hit their, uh, their news um, when this, uh, the state of Oklahoma sued Arkansas because of water quality issues and because of phosphorus. This, a lot of this, a lot of the, the phosphorus-related loss in this particular lawsuit was dealing with poultry manure application and phosphorus coming from, uh, uh, from over-application of poultry litter. But so that happened, that was back in 2006. I don't know where it is, 2006, so quite a while ago. Uh, however, these, here are some recent um, 
headlines that I found on the internet. Um, this was from this last summer uh, in July. Blue-green algae confirmed at the southeast Oklahoma State. I think this is Cedar. Cedar Lake had a blue-green algal bloom. Uh, this is uh, summer before uh, Grand Lake uh, had a blue-green algal advisory. And so as soon as these things start hitting some of these lakes, particularly touristic des destinations, it hits the, the recreation market. And, uh, and people don't like seeing that. They want to... We'd like to see the, the water stay clean. And so we, there, there's really a, a pretty, it's really quite important, I think, uh, that us in the agricultural profession uh, act as good stewards and keep the phosphorus, uh, keep the nutrients in the fields, do what we can. Uh, it's in our best interest. And uh, if we do that, uh, we'll maintain clean water and, and be able to maintain control over our inputs. Right. So now, how about cover crops? So we're looking for best management practices to try and keep nutrients out of the water. And in the past, most of our best management practices have been focused on sedi reducing sediment loss. And we do that through no-till and conservation tillage. So we'd recommend our producers use no-till. And then we'd recommend subsurface application of fertilizer. Right. Uh, if we put our fertilizer below the soil surface, then you'd have less chance of loss. Well, we didn't have really any data on cover crops, and we started getting questions. Uh, producers that want to broadcast their, their phosphorus fertilizer, it's a lot easier to do that, uh, easier to call up the co-op and tell them to go out and, and, and broadcast on phosphorus fertilizer. And they like to do this in the fall, um, more labor available. Uh, more time available, doesn't interfere with planting. And so a lot of people wanted to do the, uh, the fall broadcast fertilizer, and they say, well, what if we plant a cover crop? You know, can we fall broadcast fertilizer if we plant a cover crop? And the idea is that uh, uh, there was some evidence or some, uh, some people talking that, well, cover crops would reduce runoff. And if you plant the cover crop and reduce the chance for runoff, then maybe you'd have more phosphorus go into the soil and less of it run off. And so we thought, well, that's a great question. Uh, maybe this is going to be a good fit. And so we went ahead and put together a research study uh, to answer these questions. How much does fertilizer placement affect phosphorus loss, particularly at the right time? And so in Kansas, we get most of our rain in the spring. Uh, right now, we don't get a whole lot of rain. And the rain that we do get generally doesn't produce runoff. Right? We don't have a lot of runoff in the wintertime. And so we say, well, if you, plant, if you apply your cover or you apply your fertilizer uh, in the fall, uh, how does that phosphorus loss compare to if you're doing it in the spring? Um, so how, much, how does fertilizer placement uh, affect, cover or affect phosphorus loss? Will cover crops reduce phosphorus? And particularly, will cover crops reduce phosphorus loss from surface broadcast fertilizer? Um, in order to do this, we set up... Uh, a field, it was about a 25 acre field, 25, 30 acre field. Uh, this is an overhead view of the field. It had parallel terraces uh, going across it. Uh, we went ahead and put an additional waterway down the center of it, uh, put a berm coming along here, and divided that field into 18 smaller units. Those units are about 1.2 acres in size, and then uh, equipped each of them with a uh, monitoring. Uh, location at the edge. And so we have 18 um, edge of field monitoring setups where we put an automated sampler and monitor the water fl flow and everything coming off of this field. And then, uh, and then with those 18 plots, we can divide that up and do some replicated research and really see what's, what's happening. There's not a lot of replicated research out there uh, in this area, particularly with cover crops and no-till. A lot of the cover crop work had been done in conventional tillage where it really has really reduces sediment loss, and we thought, well, uh, how's it going to behave in no-till? So here's a picture of the site. You can kind of see the different cover crops and no cover crop uh, spots uh, right here. This is where we monitor the runoff. Um, our treatments, uh, this is a no-till corn soybean rotation. I'm going to present data today from 2016, 2017, and 2018. Um, some of the slides will just be 2016 and 2017 because I, I don't have all the 2018 data finalized yet. But uh, our treatments are, uh, we have three phosphorus treatments, either no phosphorus applied, 55 pounds of P205 applied as a fall broadcast treatment, 
and then 55 pounds of P2O5 applied in a two by two placement at planting. And then we have a cover crop uh, treatment. It's either with and without cover crop, right? So there was no cover crop and then with cover crop. And that cover crop has changed a little bit. Uh, it was winter wheat in 2016 and then a triticalian rapeseed mix the, the next two years. Um, we, uh, we did have uh, one year before this. Uh, so there was, uh, the study was actually started in 2014. So we had 2014, 2015 year. Uh, that year we were transitioning from conventional till to no-till and it was the first year of a cover crop and so I've kind of left that date out. It's a little bit of an anomaly as you, as you work into the cropping system. So we already had one year of cover crop out there and one year of no-till out there uh, when we started uh, for this data that I'm showing you here today. So here's the kind of the, again that plot layout. We've got cover crops. We've got nine different plots with cover crops, nine without, and then a mix of fertilizer application uh, there in the field. Uh, at, at the outlet of each one we have a flume and some automated equipment to collect water samples. And the way we collect these um, is every single time there's a rainfall event or a, or a runoff generating rainfall event, right? Every time there's a runoff event, we go out there and collect the water samples. And so some years we have a lot of events. I think one year we had 27 different events. Um, last year we had like five, okay? So it, it really depends from one year to the next. Uh, we're measuring runoff, sediment, total P, dissolved P. Uh, we're measuring nitrogen loss as well. I won't show you any of that data. Uh, we're measuring yield and nutrient removal and some costs and economic returns in our fields. I just don't have enough time to, to show you data on that. If you have questions, go ahead and ask and I can uh, kind of recall what I can from memory on, on those things. But uh, so I'm going to focus on, on the water quality side of this study and see how these different treatments impact phosphorus loss. And one thing to remember is that uh, when you look at rainfall throughout the year, uh, you know, it doesn't come evenly at all. And uh, this is why it's really important to do these studies with natural rainfall. There are a lot of uh, simulated rainfall studies out there. And they can show, you know, some data. They can give us a little bit of an idea. But if we really want to see what's happening in the field, we need to be looking at natural rainfall. Because what happens in this, uh, this is precipitation in inches uh, over a two-year period, right? And what happens right here when you get, you know, just one rainfall event right after another, right after another, that's a very different scenario than what happens when they're all spread out, right? And when you get an, uh, a rainfall event that's three inches, uh, that's different than one that's, that's only a, uh, an inch or so. And then also this comes uh, at different times of the year. Sometimes our fields look like this where we've got a nice growing cover crop. Uh, other times uh, our cover crop is dead but a lot of residue there. Uh, sometimes you really can't see a whole lot of difference because you've got a nice growing crop. Uh, other times it's right after harvest and the field's all bare. Uh, so these events happen, you know, the cover crop is very dynamic. It's not going to have the same effect in the spring as it does in the fall, as it does in the winter, right? And so it's pretty important to look at this throughout the entire growing season uh, because that field changes a lot. And so when I show you the data, you'll see sometimes we had effects, sometimes we didn't, sometimes the cover crop helped, sometimes it didn't. And it's because it's changing, right? Uh, so we're going to start and, and look at runoff. And so that was our first hypothesis was that our cover crop was going to reduce runoff because it was going to use water. And by using water, we were going to reduce the amount that comes off in runoff. Um, and you can't even see the letters on this, but uh, I anticipated that a little bit. So here are the bars. Uh, this, these are the different events uh, for the past three years. Um, the first bar here is brown. That's no cover. Uh, the next bar is green. That's with cover. I'm not sure if you can see that very well, those colors. But that, uh, you'll see that uh, sometimes, so these blue, uh, these blue squares here are going to highlight those events where the cover crop decreased runoff, right? So over those four or three years, we had four events where our cover crop actually decreased, significantly decreased runoff. Some of the other ones you might look like, it looks like it decreased it, but it's not significant, right? There's a lot of variability there. We had another set of events, these red boxes, where the cover crop actually increased runoff. And we didn't necessarily expect this, but some of you who may have been planting cover crops and working with them are probably very well aware 
that you've run across in springs where you kill your cover crop and then that soil stays wet for the next three, three weeks when it rains one after another and it never dries out. And the cover crop just, you know, all that residue shades the soil. All that residue slows down the wind and the evaporation and the soil stays wet longer. And so in certain situations, and we found that in certain situations when you had uh, rainfall events that set up just right, uh, we had more runoff off of our cover crop plots than we did off of our non-cover crop plots. And that was a little bit of, in, you know, that was interesting to us. We didn't expect that. And uh, actually, I've talked to some producers, and they said, well, they had a hard time believing. They said, well, I'm out there. I stand next to my field, and I, I look at the water coming off of my field and off of my neighbor's field, and I see a lot more water coming off of their field, right? And so then we looked at, well, let's look at, at how cover crops might affect other aspects of runoff, right? This is the peak runoff rate, okay? Uh, again, similar setup here. We're looking at all the different events, and uh, I'll highlight the ones. Uh, we had several events here, and this is just two years. I haven't had the chance to work up this last year's data here. Um, but we had a, a fairly good trend of cover crop reducing the peak runoff rate, okay? Uh, only one time, did it increase the peak runoff rate? The other times we're reducing the peak runoff rate. The other thing, uh, so if it's reducing the peak runoff rate, but you're getting the same or same or sometimes more runoff, what's happening? Well, it's, it's increasing the duration, okay? This was really consistent, um, almost, you know, quite consistently more than half of the cases. Uh, these are all the events over like, two millimeters of runoff, so over a, a few, uh, over eight hundredths of an inch, I believe, uh, eight or ten hundredths of an inch of runoff. Um, anyway, uh, pretty consistently we're, we're increasing the duration of runoff. So what's happening, uh, if we add all this up, this over two years, we've added it up, uh, no effect um, on the total volume of runoff over the entire year. Okay, but what's happening is we're changing the way that runoff comes off. And so here are two curves. This is the flow rate. Um, the no cover is this first peak that comes up a little bit higher. It peaks sooner, comes up higher, and drops faster. Right? The second curve, this one right here, this is this, you know, the exact same rainfall event. These are right next to each other. It comes up with a cover crop. It comes up not quite nearly as high comes back down, but a lot slower. Those two events have actually uh, the exact same amount of runoff, okay? Those two curves are the exact same amount of runoff. They just come off in a different pattern. And so that's what we see happening. Uh, our runoff is coming off slower. This is a really good thing uh, uh, from, you know, from an erosion standpoint. Uh, a lot of the erosion happens when that runoff's coming off. It has more power if it comes off faster. If it comes off slower, there's less erosive force. And so we see less erosion. 70% uh, decrease in erosion. It's pretty obvious when you're out there in the field looking at what's coming off the field. Uh, those crops, uh, those fields without runoff or without cover crops, uh, we still get pretty muddy, murky water. Even in a no-till system, right? There's still a lot of bare soil out there in, in the no-till system, and the cover crops help hold that soil in place and uh, reduce, reduce the erosion. Here's a, a, an image of that, uh, the effect of, on erosion by event. Uh, you can see it really, really consistently across every single event, uh, pretty much even the really small events. Uh, where we get really, really low erosion, we still get less erosion when we have a cover crop. And so that's, uh, that was something also that I, I, honestly, I didn't expect to see. I thought our producers were doing really well uh, protecting against erosion with a good, uh, no-till. And I figured, well, you can't get a lot better than that. You know, no-till drops erosion pretty low. Uh, but here we're getting, you know, about 70% less uh, erosion. So uh, another thing that we were a little surprised about is just to see the, the big decrease in erosion. Now, if we have such a uh, big decrease in erosion, we would expect decreases in particulate phosphorus. Um, 
this is uh, the effect of cover crop on particular particulate phosphorus, and I think I've got um, there we go. All of those uh, one, I guess, in one case here, one case we actually increase the particulate phosphorus loss with a cover crop. All the others, all the other eight or nine. Uh, instances there where we had a significant difference, we decreased uh, particulate phosphorus. And so by decreasing erosion, we decreased the amount of phosphorus attached to the sediment. So that's a good thing. Uh, now, uh, let's look at dissolved phosphorus. <clears throat> this is another thing that was a little bit surprising to us. Uh, actually, we're increasing dissolved phosphorus. Right? And this is pretty consistent. Um, I highlighted all of them. It's basically every single one except for about five, right? Um, but look at all of them, and you're increasing, and it's not just a small increase, but you know, sometimes you're looking about double the concentration of dissolved phosphorus coming off the field. And so uh, there, are actually, there had been some other studies that had looked at this uh, across the, the nation. Uh, most of them were actually in northern latitudes, like in Wisconsin and uh, I think there were some in Michigan. There were some like up in Canada. I'm like, I don't know why we'd believe Canadian research, but anyway, no, we do. But you know, it's very different, very different climate, right? Even Kansas is different than Oklahoma. You go all the way up in Canada, uh, there they had frozen snowmelt runoff, and that was causing an increase in dissolved phosphorus where they had cover crops. All the cover crop tissue was like frozen in ice, and as the ice melts, they'd have this big flush of dissolved phosphorus. And we said, well, we have a very different climate down here in Kansas, so we don't expect to see that because we don't have snow melt runoff. And you definitely don't. We probably don't have it down here in Oklahoma either. Right? So we figured, well, we're not going to see that effect. Uh, but in, it, we did see it. And it, it doesn't have to do with snow melt runoff like they saw up there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why we think this is happening. Right? Um, I don't have a whole lot of data to say exactly why it's happening, but I can talk about uh, why we think. And so, uh, oh, before I talk about it, though, let's just look at total phosphorus. So what's, it, what's happening to total phosphorus? We're decreasing uh, particulate phosphorus. We're increasing dissolved phosphorus. Where's the balance there? Well, um, it's been variable, right? Uh, here are a few cases where we've decreased total phosphorus loss. Um, few others where we've increased it. Um, up until this last year, it was kind of a 50-50 split, right? Sometimes we decrease total phosphorus, sometimes we increase it. When you look at the entire year, th there wasn't a lot of difference. Uh, however, in 2018, uh, we were a little bit more consistent in increasing total phosphorus loss. Um, 2018 was a really dry year. Um, we only had a few runoff events, um, and so that may have contributed to, uh, to some of what we see there. I'm not, sh I'm not sure that that's going to continue or not in the, in the future, but uh, in 2018, it was a little bit more of a consistent trend in increasing total phosphorus loss. So now, why might we see this? If we look at the phosphorus cycle, there are a lot of different uh, phosphorus can uh, moves through a lot of different pools in the soil. Right? Uh, we try and put our fertilizer pea in and our manure, uh, try and increase the amount that the crop might take up, uh, but then that can be absorbed to soil. It can uh, precipitate and dissolve. It can go into organic forms. You have uh, actually a fair amount of phosphorus that recycles through, through the system. Right? Uh, we've been keeping track of the phosphorus budget in our fields, and uh, we can put probably about, we're applying. Um, 55 pounds of P205 to the surface, right, as fertilizer. Uh, the crop residue will return about 25 to 30 pounds of P205 back to the surface, right? If you put a cover crop out there, you can add maybe 5 to 10 pounds of P205, again, back on the surface. And so you're putting, you know, you can recycle, you know, we're looking up to 35 pounds of P205 going back on the surface every year in residue. So you don't want to forget uh, this organic pool because that's moving uh, phosphorus from deep in the soil back up through the crop 
onto the, resi onto the soil, uh, soil surface, where it's then susceptible to loss. Um, then you can end up with uh, you know, erosion and, and so forth, uh, some runoff that in the past we've dealt with, or we've generally seen a lot of particulate phosphorus loss, and then a very small fraction that's dissolved, right? And so our hope would, was that we would you know, put some alternative management out there and decrease uh, the erosion and then keep that dissolved phosphorus the same or maybe in a little less and then reduce overall phosphorus loss. Instead, what we're seeing, we're decreasing the particulate, but our dissolved is increasing and we're maintaining about the same amount of phosphorus loss. So why, uh, here's a little uh, schematic of our, uh, of our slope. It rains on our slope. Uh, that rain interacts, often we talk about it interacting with that top zero to one inch. Um, it can transport particulate phosphorus with erosion. This is what we can trap real easy with no-till and with uh, cover crop. Then you have the dissolved release from the soil. And uh, that gets transported off. You have some fertilizer that goes on the surface. Not just fertilizer, but also uh, any phosphorus that goes on with the crop residue. Uh, that's now on the surface. That can be rinsed off uh, as dissolved phosphorus. And uh, so you have dissolved release from fertilizer and maybe crop residue. So one hypothesis is that you could have more phosphorus coming out of cover crop residue. And we have seen a little bit of a spike following the, the, the time when we kill the cover crop. Uh, that first rainfall event after we kill the cover crop tends to see more dissolved phosphorus. But I don't think that that's the whole story. Um, we don't often talk about this down here, this interflow, right? This is where water would go into the soil, can actually flow through the soil, right along the soil surface, and then can come back out. Okay, there's a lot of complex things. We really simplify the system if we say, yeah, the, 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 the water just interacts with that top inch. That's a, that's a pretty big simplification. <clears throat> and we see this with the cover crop. We see that we're getting about the same amount of water that's leaving the system, but it's coming off a lot slower. Is it possible that we've altered the way that water interacts with the soil? rather than maybe just running across the surface, interacting with that top inch. Maybe it's coming into the soil, flowing down slope a little bit, hitting some other you know, anomaly in the soil that causes it to come out, and then, and then keep moving. I'm not sure. I guess it's easy for me to hypothesize. But definitely, we know that there is this interflow uh, process occurring. Um, that could be causing the water to pick up more phosphorus as it moves through, through the soil, right? There's not a lot of data on cover crop effects on phosphorus loss, but we do have data on no-till effects on phosphorus loss. And you know, it's not too, what we're finding is not too much different than when we find when we look at all the no-till data. Okay, so uh, no-till decreases. This is uh, some data out of, a, of a, out of a database that Darren Harmel put together. Uh, he works down in, down in Texas with ARS. And uh, a lot of edge of field runoff data. And we see that in general, if you compare conventional till to conservation and no-till, you decrease sediment loss. And that's not a big surprise. Along with that, we decrease phosphorus loss as well. Uh, most of this comes because we decrease that particulate bound phosphorus. Um, however, if we look at dissolved phosphorus here, so this is the same figure, uh, we're actually seeing an increase in the dissolved phosphorus loss from no-till fields. We've seen this in a few different places. So this is uh, one example, one data set that shows increasing dissolved phosphorus with, with no-till. Um, they've done a lot of watershed modeling or monitoring near Lake Erie because of the, uh, the phosphorus issues they've had there uh, associated with algal blooms for, for many years. And uh, over time, they've seen a decrease in se uh, sediment concentration uh, going into Lake Erie, pretty consistent, and they've tied this back to no-till. They've had an increase in no-till in, in those watersheds. Uh, they see total phosphorus, it decreased uh, 
maintained level, maybe increasing a little bit, but still pretty much uh, a much lower total phosphorus uh, concentration in their water. If we look at dissolved reactive phosphorus, that came down, but then rebounded and is on the increase uh, quite a bit more than the total phosphorus, showing again there's a shift where they're seeing more dissolved phosphorus. When you get rid of the sediment bound phosphorus, the phosphorus still moves, it's still, still mobile, and it, and it moves in a dissolved form. Uh, one other data set here, again, this is no-till. We just don't have enough information on cover crops. But here, this was a, 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 a meta-analysis. So they looked at a lot of different studies that looked at no-till effects on, on uh, phosphorus in runoff. And here they see this, uh, this line here would say there was no impact. Um, they see that in general, no-till decreased total phosphorus. In general, it decreased particulate phosphorus but it increased the dissolved phosphorus. And this is the concentration and the load. Um, but they see an increase in dissolved phosphorus. Well, we're seeing similar stuff with, with cover crops as well. 